You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. So last week we looked at uh, chapter 3, which is sort of an action-packed one. It's got some of those more uh, well-known stories, I guess, from Solomon's life on uh, his wisdom. That's ma- the main sort of thing we got out of, out of last week. He went to Gibeon to worship God, um, and during the night there, um, he, uh, well, God appeared to him, as we know the story, and, and he asked, God asked what all his heart desired, and of course Solomon asked for wisdom. <clears throat> and it wasn't just wisdom because he wanted to be the wisest man in the world, he wanted wisdom to lead his people. He, want, he, he talked about uh, leading his people as a shepherd and as a captain, which were sort of important things for him. Um, and we looked at how, how David, his father, and even back to Joshua and Moses, uh, those, two, those two thoughts of being a servant and a captain uh, is exactly what, what God needed for, uh, for Solomon to be as a leader and as a king. And, and that he did need God in his life. Even though he was wise, he was a big, he was a big, uh, big time king. He needed God in his life to help him with this daunting task of leading the people. And that we saw that we can gain godly wisdom too. By experiencing godly things, we don't need uh, wisdom like street smarts or or high uh, education. We need wisdom that prepares us for eternity. And to trade uh, trade earthly values for heavenly values. Uh, we also saw how this wisdom played out in his life with the story of the two women, the two harlots, one who was ultimately good and the other one was ultimately bad, um, and how this story, uh, we sort of got rushed at the end, uh, but how this story can be seen as a parable uh, between uh, Jerusalem and Samaria, um, who were bitter rivals, both uh, trying to claim the, uh, the Messiah as their own, um, but in the end, Christ will appear and judge, as Solomon did in, this, in that story, um, and restore the hope of Israel once again. Um, so basically, Solomon has taken over. He's taken over the throne. We saw that last week. Um, he's quite young. His father has died. Uh, and we suggested a few weeks ago, or a few studies ago, it was actually last year, but we suggested he was around, I suggested he was around about 24, which is... Um, quite a bit older than some people think. Some commentaries think he was around about about 20, maybe late teens. But whatever the case is, he's a very young man. He's he's been. His father said that he was young and tender, so we know that he was he was young. He took over the throne, so it suggests a lot about his inexperience. And since he's become king, he's taken the care of the people around him. Uh, some people that he needed to to get rid of to you know preventing the kingdom being uh, uh, in proper peace. He established a treaty with Pharaoh. <clears throat> he married his daughter. Um, he travelled with the congregation to Gibeon to worship God. He received wisdom from God and he exercised this dealing, uh, this wisdom in dealing with his people. So he's taken on a lot of things already. Um, we saw from our earlier studies that he did have a lot of people around him. He had some priests, he had princes, um, a lot of people David commanded to be with his son as he tried to prepare himself as a king, being quite young. <clears throat> uh, but as he progressed as king, Solomon had to set up a few men to help him run the kingdom. Because being a king isn't easy. Um, it's not as easy as like sitting on the throne and just making decisions. The whole sort of kingdom needed running and he needed to set up a council or a cabinet as sort of we see today, so the running of his kingdom would be smooth. And the chapter records all the men. Uncle Bert read it, read it for us in uh, chapter 4 there. And Solomon himself records in his diaries, his almanac in Proverbs, he says why he needed to set up a council. Because <clears throat> he says that plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. And how true is that? If we apply this to ourselves, as, as we always do in our own lives, um, and we apply it to our ecclesial life, uh, we will ignore this advice at our peril. Because it's too much for one person to, to rule, 
Um, you know, in Ecclesia, you can't just have one person controlling it. This is why we have arranging brethren, subcommittees. Um, we plan together, and that's great. It's, it's, it's a communal thing. And we can, um, we can use the same advice from people. We, we can use advice from people that we think are wise, who we feel are experienced to help us in our daily lives. We always do that. But plans fail without succeed, uh, without, without counsel, sorry, but they succeed with many advisors. And we may not agree on everything. I'm sure that there's probably more people that disagree with things than agree. But the more help and advice we get, the better the result. Because perspectives can be broadened. Uh, because I think we all tend to think that it should be done a certain way. Um, and that's the only way. That's sort of the way that we think. Uh, but we all have different points of view. Uh, and if our intentions are right, ways to improve the way to do in ecclesial life, you know, it's better to do with other people. And it's up to those making the real decisions to listen to all those perspectives and think about them before proceeding. And Solomon certainly had a, uh, had a certain way of doing things. Uh, and I think results would be very different in the kingdom if he had just done all the things his way. So he used some wise heads to help him. Um, another chapter in pro another proverb that he wrote for lack of guidance a nation falls but victory is won through many advisors so he's he's definitely got his uh, he's acknowledges the importance of many advisors suggesting it's sort of a life or death situation um, his thoughts are with the people at all times making sure that his people are safe another way that he is you know he's, he's like christ in that way that he's like a shepherd he's, he cares for his flock rather than himself so he puts together this council, <clears throat> many councillors actually, um, and we're, you know, he, he, he put in his life um, people he thought would help him, he would help his people and the kingdom to succeed, um, and from our own perspective, uh, choosing people we trust um, for advice and counsel uh, will set us up to, and we will turn to them whenever we want in our daily lives. So he, he did need to think about it and work out who we needed to put in these these positions. So I'm not going to read through it again, <clears throat> but these are the names. Hey, uh, Azariah, <clears throat> actually, I probably shouldn't, I should have done a bit of proofreading because now I can't even read them myself. You did a great job on them. Um, Eli Horef, Ahiah, Jehoshaphat, Benaiah, Zadok the priest, Abiath the priest, Azariah the son of Nathan, uh, Zabod, Ahisha and Adoniram. So that is King Solomon's cabinet. The people who ruled together with Solomon. And before we go on, I'd like to point out there's one man there, Azariah, the son, uh, he says the son of Nathan. He was over the officers, over the officers. And from verse, so that was from the verse 1 to 6, these men. And from verse 7 to all the way through to 19 of chapter 4. Uh, they are the uh, officers. That is the officer. So there's the princes and the officers. And that one man, uh, Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. So in the next few verses we read that, um, he had the 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household. <clears throat> Each man in his month made a provision, it says. So we'll keep that in mind that Azariah, he's got a lot of men under him. Um, and the names of them ones, we can see that's all their names. I'll put them down there. Um, and we'll have a look at these men, uh, at who these men are and why they're put in the record. Because I think it's, uh, it's very interesting, in my opinion. So how did Solomon choose these men? How did he choose these men? What attributes was he looking for? Well, Exodus 18, verse 21, this is detailing Moses when he uh, is putting together a similar sort of council when he was uh, in charge of the children of Israel. He said, But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundred, fifties, and tens. So able men, fear of God, that's what he's looking for, upright, and most importantly, in it for the right reasons. They're in it for the right reasons, for God, for truth, uh, and not for power and covetousness. That's, so he was looking for the, someone who wants to be in it for the right reasons, not for power. 
Um, and I'm sure Solomon would have taken uh, the same sort of method when he was looking for his cabinet and for those who were going to help rule this kingdom. So running through the list of men, who, these were Solomon's rulers, and we note that they all have roles. When we, if, if we were listening, it would have been, you would have seen that all of them had a role. In fact, there was 11 men, there was, there's 12 roles, um, all except for one man who had a, a very special job. Actually, I'll come to that in a minute. He had a very special job, um, and that's Zabad. And Zabad is, you might have noticed, was the king's friend. He was uh, not only a king's friend, but he was also a principal officer. So we had two jobs. Okay, so I'll go to that slide now. The word princes. I actually had to uh, pick up the strongs for this one. Or I typed it into eSword. Um, but the word prince, princes is actually a leadership role. I wonder why they were called uh, princes, but they're just leaders or, or, head, or head person, just a chief. So they're described as principal princes, but they're actually just rulers. Um, and some of the men, um, there was three princes there, uh, sorry, priests there. Zabot, Zadok, Abiathar, and Zabad are described as priests. <clears throat> but that's the word Cohen, which can be a priest, but it's one of those words which has a few different meanings. It can be a leader um, or an elder in life. So Zadok and Abiathar were priests, but Zabad was just a leader. That's what he was. Um, it's used a few, quite a few times, uh, that word Cohen is used quite a few times to describe an, el uh, an elder or a general leader, but it's uh, priest, we read it as priest. So um, I'm just going to have a quick look at these names now. So these are all the king's men, <clears throat> as they're recorded. These are sort of the names that we always sort of just tend to skip over in our, in our daily readings and just like, oh, I'm not sure what that means, but... I've had a look into these, and they're, um, and they're, it's interesting how some of these tie together. So Azariah, we have there on the left, the grandson of Zadok, it says. It says actually in, the, in, the, in verse 2 that he is actually the son of Zadok, but it's, uh, it's the word ben, which means the grandson, or, or it just means an ancestor. So in this case, it was uh, 1 Chronicles 6 verse 8 tells us that he is the son of Ahimeaz, and not Zadok, but Zadok was the, the father of Ahimea. So grandfather was Zadok the priest. So his father was, uh, this is um, Ahimeaz, he was loyal to David, um, was known as a runner for God. Okay, so that's what he was. He was a runner for David and for God. He was sent by Hushai to tell David of Absalom's defeat. So he is, he is described as a good man, uh, mentioned in... Um, over in first in second Samuel, but not mentioned in first of Kings, and you wonder why. But I think it's probably because um, maybe Zadok being a priest is maybe just is better criteria than being a fast runner. So they put that in the record as uh, as Zadok, not as Ahimeaz. So there's not much here about his role. It just says he's a minister of the state, um, a head of state, basically. If you are looking at the roles in these days. Uh, the next two, Eli, Horef, and Ahiah, they're scribes for Solomon, as, as uh, Shisha was scribed for David. Um, and it says that they are the, the sons of Shisha. So Shisha was scribed for David. These two were scribes for Solomon, who is Shisha's son. Uh, they're to write down the king's words and, and edicts and reclaim them to the people, similar to... Um, I've written his name, Shaphan, that's him. Shaphan the scribe in, in scripture. So it would have been a very big job, especially knowing Solomon and all of his sayings and things that he would have been, would have been uh, saying all the time. He's a general scribe. He would have written down law. He would have read, read it to the king, all those sort of things. Uh, Jehoshaphat, so his job is the recorder, uh, similar to a scribe. He's more of an observer. He writes down history. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, and I think King, uh, yeah, later in history, King Ahasuerus asked for men for a copy of the record of the Chronicles to help him sleep. And that would have been Jehoshaphat's job to write uh, a record similar to that, the records of the Chronicles. ben was, uh, he's been in our story so far. He's one of David's mighty men, very loyal to David. He was the head of his army. Uh, no, the head of David's bodyguard. So that's right, because Joab was the head of the army um, and stayed with David when Adonijah revolted against him. 
Um, and Joab, of course, went with Adonijah. And Benaiah took over his role as the captain of the army after Joab was gone. Zadok and Abiathar. So Zadok, we know, was the high priest. Um, what's interesting about this? Who can tell me interesting about having Abiathar in this list? Because he was um, faithful to David for some time and he protected him as well and was replaced with Zadok. That's right. So he's mentioned in the list of people Solomon had in his council. But in previous, we saw in chapter 2 that he was basically told that he had to be, he was sent away. Instead of killing him, because David said, can you please get rid of um, Abiathar? Instead he said, uh, I'll send you up north and I won't touch you and you're not allowed to come back. If you come back, we'll, you'll die. So it seems strange that he's mentioned here. Um, we may recall that... Um, he went to Anna, so he went to Anathoth after he rebelled against against David, um, and told not never to come back, which he didn't obviously. So a few, there's a few commentaries around this. Um, people say that it was suggested it was given a job, job given to um, Abiathar by God, so therefore it's still a role that should be mentioned, um, or maybe it's the, this list was compiled so many years before, um, or maybe that. That there was, you know, two separate houses of the priests. That's another suggestion. And Abiathar was head of the one in the north, where he was, where he was, might have been reinstated by Solomon, and Zadok to the other house. But um, I don't, I can't really think of a real good reason why he's put in here. Um, there is a lot of different theories, and I think possibly is because, um, yeah, it's possibly because he was reinstated by Solomon in the north, um, and Zadok in the other house. If anyone has any other uh, reasons why you think, come to me after. Um, Azariah, the son of Nathan, he was over the officers. Okay, we saw that, we talked about that a second ago. Uh, and it says that he's, oh, Nathan the prophet, of course. That's another thing. Nathan the prophet, he's here again, a great friend of David. Zabad, uh, he was the king's friend and the chamberlain, okay, or the principal officer, Zabad. Um, Hushai is described as David's friend in 1 Chronicles 23. So this is an actual role, being the king's friend, uh, an official title. And this was Solomon's, king, or Solomon's friend, his personal servant and friend, basically responsible for the king and his health. Um, it's basically being a shepherd. That's where the word, uh, the, the, that word friend comes from. It's being a shepherd. Make sure the king has everything he needs. Uh, and then Ahisha, he was responsible for being the palace administrator. He was over the household, meaning it was responsible for making sure the, the, the palace of Solomon ran smoothly. Um, Adoniram. Now, this man, he is over the tribute. Okay, so it sounds like he was the treasurer. That's what it sounds like. You know, he had the key to the mountains of Solomon's gold, and he got to count that every day. However, he was basically just... The tribute basically means he was head of the gang of forced labourers, and he had a lot, Solomon had a lot of forced labourers. So, sort of a tax consumption, uh, of a, a tax, so um, like a conscription, I guess, um, where men who do not have money to pay tax, instead, they worked unpaid to make sure that they had enough food for their families, materials, um, and all that sort of thing. All right, so this man was important. He had to deal with all of that. He had to deal with all the tribute, which was super important for making sure that everything ran smoothly on this, in this metropolis of a kingdom. Um, he, was, he had the entire government to rule over. You know, there was, there was so many labourers to deal with, mainly due to all this building work Solomon had going on. It's not only just the temple and his palace he was building. He was basically building cities after cities after cities. Um, you know, and he was head of, the, head of that department, making sure that everybody had a role and everything was going smoothly. He was the, basically the, the supervisor over that. <clears throat> um, so all of these men, Benai, Azariah, Ahishar, Adoniram, so they're the lead, they were the leaders of their own sectors of government, um, and the others, some of them had different roles. So there's our 11 men, the inner circle of Solomon's kingdom, the men who shared with the glorious king in the greatest part of God's kingdom on earth that has ever been recorded. He was there. They were all there to help it all thrive. So this process is not, not uncommon. 
it happens all the way through the history of uh, through the history of kings and rulers. These people uh, needed lots of people to help them. It was a big job. Solomon have, uh, would have learnt from his father the right way to run a kingdom because he was he was very good at it. David was. <clears throat> he had actually David had set up his own cabinet. Uh, that's one thing that is recorded. I think it's recorded a lot of a lot of different kings were, but David's is recorded in Second Samuel eight, uh, in and verse fifteen. A number of years later, in Second Samuel twenty, verse twenty three, and First Chronicles eighteen, verse fourteen. So he sets up his own cabinet in those three ones. I think he did it three different times. Obviously, uh, there was a few different reasons why he had to do it a few different times. He can. So if we compare the list of what David did it. We generally skip over these these things. Um, I certainly do when I'm doing my daily readings. I skip over all these names and don't think much of them. Um, but if you sit down and, and compare some of these lists with the reason why uh, David did it in his in his time, we can actually see similarities in the way that Solomon uh, had structured his government. You can see on the on the screen there also um, how these people were so similar to David uh, in the way David did it. Um, Nathan the prophet, by the way, which were mentioned, is not mentioned on these lists. Um, and I don't think it's because he wasn't around uh, David or Solomon, because he wasn't even in David's list. Uh, but I think Nathan the prophet would have had a big role in what they, what these people were doing. Um, probably because this, the job of Nathan was more God's, God's role. He was, he was God's prophet, doing the work of, of God. So I'm sure he would have. Uh, given as much advice to David and Solomon as, as was needed, but he isn't mentioned as part of the council. <clears throat> uh, Adoniram, uh, which is, he's the last one there, the leader of the tribute. He's only mentioned later in David's list um, and not the first list. So he has two lists. The first one, Adoniram, was on there, uh, <coughs> was not on there, but not on the first one because it wasn't until he started preparing for the building of the temple that he needed this man to help with the forced labour. Um, and if you remember in first of Chronicles 21 he decided to number Israel which obviously got him into a bit of trouble um, he was probably in the work process of working out what was needed um, and realised that many 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 men were needed to help with the labour um, and at the end of the story he found the place where the temple was to be built um, and oh, in his first list David incidentally of his first council he did he had many of his uh, his sons but he removed them obviously because of a lot of the revolt that went on in his family um, so he got rid of them obviously his family had issues um, and they proved themselves unworthy to control uh, to continue in that role which is a bit sad to David had to remove them all but this is one of his lists it says that in 2nd Samuel 8 verse 15 so David reigned over all Israel David administered just judgment and justice to all his people Joab the son of Zeruiah was over the army Joshaphat the son of Eli Iad was recorder Zadok the son of Ahitab Ahimelech the son of Abiathar Sariah Benai the son of Jehoiada was over both the Cherethites and Pelethites and David's sons were chief ministers so I've highlighted Joab there because you can see that Joab was the very first man on his list that's where David's mind went you know, that was the focus of his reign. He was a man of war. And it's a big difference the way that David, uh, sorry, Solomon ran his cabinet. He basically talks about straight away recorders and scribes and very peaceful roles, priests. He hardly even mentions uh, anything to do with the army, which Joab was front and centre, uh, and so was Benai there. So, what did Solomon uh, give? What did Solomon order to be given as tribute every month? It said there that he was uh, to give a, a victual um, each man his month in a year made provision. So what did Solomon order to be given as tribute every month? Well, the answer to that is food. That's what Solomon gave. He gave food. So what did David order his officers to give as tribute every month? Does anyone know? If you think about David, it's actually pretty easy. He said uh, he was going to give, uh, as tribute, he gave soldiers. David gave soldiers, which was 24,000 men for the army, which rotated, rotated every month. 24,000 men 
which rotated around the nations of the 12 tribes, whereas um, Solomon gave massive orders of food because he was into agriculture and uh, those sort of things. Um, and David told, he told, was told not to build the house of God because he was a man of war, a man who had you know, Joab as front of his council, this ruthless man, Benai, the leader of his bodyguard. There's a lot of emphasis on this army. And Solomon was to be king. He was to build the house as a man of peace. And his council is not headed by the army. Benai is there. He's sort of his, his, the, head of the head of the army. But there's not a lot of, lot of emphasis on the army. Tributes, you know, Solomon had priests, he had scribes. The tributes are all more prominent in his inner circle. So the tributes of, um, yeah, basically food. That was basically the, the thing that he had. That's the thing that sh- so much fertile land in this, in this country he had. So why have we bothered mentioning these names? There is a reason why they're here, I think, that it's actually very important. Why does pointing out these two men, David and Solomon, have even having a council even matter? And that's I'm sure some of you are wondering. And I think we're starting to see a pattern between these two kings. Both had very similar ideas in who to help them run the kingdom, uh, with the exception of David, who's focused on war, Solomon on sort of the economics of the, of the place. But these are the people, and you can see them there. Uh, sorry, next one. Down the bottom. So it says, so there's the prince that is, is recorded in First Kings 4, uh, who the father is, what their role is, and what they were in David's reign, or how they are related. Every single one of them, except for Ahisha, which doesn't say, there's not much about him. It just says that he was over the, over the household. All the other ones talks about their, their father, or their grandfather, and how they are related to David's life. It says so. So Zadok in Azariah was priest. He was priest in David's, in David's day. Um, the next two, they, Shisha was their father. Shisha was David's scribe. Jehoshaphat was recorded during David's reign as well as during uh, Solomon's. Uh, Benaiah, Jeho- who was the son of uh, Jehoiada, he was the prince of David's priests. Um, Zadok and Abiathar, of course, there was, they were both at some point loyal to David. Azariah... Nathan the prophet, great friend to David. Zabad, who was, uh, it says that it was a son of Nathan. It doesn't actually specifically say son of, uh, sorry, Nathan the prophet. Um, that's Zabad. So it could be his brother. That's why I've done there. It could be his brother. Um, but I'm unsure on that one. Um, but either way, if it's, if, if it's Nathan, uh, which is Solomon's, uh, Solomon or David's is, is, it, is Nathan Solomon's I'm getting a complete mental blank here Solomon's brother or Solomon yeah, was, yes yeah. that's right sorry for that um, and then Adoniram which was the son of Abda he was Abda was the of the Levites in Judutham and Judutham was a part of the Le- Levitical or the, of the priest, priesthood in David's day so what are we seeing here What are we seeing? So we're seeing here that David chose people for his council that worked well for him. That's what David did in his day. Solomon chose similar people throughout his reign who worked well for him. Okay, a lot of the people David chose, Solomon chose too. Or chose to keep them on. And a lot of the people uh, Solomon chose were sons or relations to those who David chose. And a quote from Proverbs 27, verse 10. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Because he had a great relationship with his father. Uh, they, had a, they did have a great relationship throughout, his, throughout their life. He would have been around his father when all David's close friends were around. Who helped him run the country. You know, he had his own council and Solomon might have been there watching and figuring out what's going on. They would might have had children. All these children, all these people he's got in here would have been cho- uh, children of the people David had in his council. And they would have also been friends with Solomon. And it's something we see in our daily lives, isn't it? When we are friends with certain people, our children become friends with their children. 
When our children make friends with certain people, we tend to make friends with their parents, just so you know, we all sort of like are, are friendly, uh, friendly families. And there's a lesson here too, respect for our friends, for our brethren and sisters, when our children are around is very important because children can be very observant. From experience, they, they hear everything we say and if we badmouth our brethren and sisters or, or other people in front of them, they will start thinking the same. And this is a commitment from generation to generation to carry on the same message which worked well for you know, he worked well for his father and works well for Solomon. So that message carried on into his council as it did throughout the reign of David. Brothers working together, father and son working together, friends working together. The right values go the distance from generation to generation. Different families, we know there's lots of different views, different cultures, but different families working together, young and old. And Ecclesia cannot run without members working together. And it's a message which, it's all the way through this story of Solomon, working together. You'll see it a lot through, especially when they're building the temple, how important it is to work together. To make something work, we work together. The temple of the living God is built on good values by good people, working together for one cause. Even the grandson of Zadok, uh, the priest, was with Sol Solomon. <clears throat> So grandson of Zadok, actually it brings me to an important uh, question about when this list is written. Um, do we think that it's put down here chronologically? Um, that that's when it happened directly after sort of the story of the, of the two women, then they sort of compiled the list and he's like, oh, I need to get myself a cabinet. Well, I'm going to suggest that it's put here for a, a specific reason, but it's not chronological. I think it's vastly uh, not and this is something that's been compiled throughout his entire life. I think that this probably was, could have started as a, as a small, small group of a few of those and, and grew over time. Um, some of these positions may have even changed over the years, but these are the most important people that were in those specific, specific, um, specific positions, um, probably based on the friendships and the, the, the lesson, I think, that we're trying to get over that David and Solomon's uh, lists are the same. Because in the follow following verses of the officers, some of them we read that they, in verse 11, which says, which had Tap Tapath, the daughter of Solomon, to wife. The daughter of Solomon. Okay, so we're talking about him being about 24 or 25 when he became king. And if this happens straight away, I don't think one of them is going to be married to his daughter. So there's a few different... Um, indications to think that this isn't a chronological list but it was compiled maybe the end of his life but it's just been put here at a certain at, at this time for us to uh, to read so and it says also that some of the sons and grandsons here would have been mentioned would have been like little tiny kids when uh, like Zadok's grandson would have probably been quite young I think at this at the time if it was compiled in chronological order <clears throat> but the important men are mentioned here for a reason for us to find lessons from Okay, we're going to have a quick look at these people that Azariah are over. These are uh, these twelve officers. Now, there's quite a few of them. The son of Hur, the son of Dekar, the son of Hesed, the son of Abinadab, uh, Banna, the son of Eliad, the son of Geba, Abinadab. And she's weird, isn't it? That some of these are named by their name, and some of them are named by their father. Now, can anyone think of why that is? Because I can't. It's a, a bit of an open question, that one. I did have a look at their, uh, their, their names, uh, looked up their father's names, all these people, her, Decca, um, and tried to sort of tie them to the, to the record, but I was sort of struggled a bit. Um, but it's on my to-do list to do that. But these are the people um, on, uh, who are the officers uh, over the land, over the tribute. <clears throat> Um, so a few of these name, people were married to Solomon's daughters. So there must have been prominent men in Solomon's life for, for them to be married to his daughters. Uh, these men were officers over the 12 sectors of the land. So it was split up into 12 land, um, sections, which are the same sectors that David had um, set up previously, um, except for a slight change. Um, everything 
even if it was working fine, um, he sort of thought that he wanted to tweak a few things. That's the land basically after Solomon, uh, in David's time it was a little bit different. He split it up a little bit differently, um, wanted to make it a little bit more effective, which is something that even in ecclesial life, you know, if we need to, to change something to make things more effectively, we do. We don't need to get bogged down in the same routine all the time um, as it, it's always worked. We think, oh, it's always worked, so let's not change it. Um, Solomon thought we can improve this and change the times to get the full potential out of, uh, out of, the, yeah, out of the land. So we can, um, you can read through all those, those parts and I've read through them and sort of tried to find out where they are and that's as close as I could get. Um, it's interesting that some of them overlap other sections because it talks about where it, where it started, some mountain, some, uh, some town, some you know, river it talks about. Um, there's one guy there you can see who's got number 12. He's got a fair chunk of land to himself. Some of them overlap. Um, are there, so seven and six basically go into that land as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically where where each of these people have uh, have their little district to look after. They they are the officers of those those places. Um, and they they were like twelve states. They were provinces of the land. Each sector had a, had to provide a tribute each year of food. Uh, so every month, basically, so it was one month until it was twelve months each month one of those people had to give a tribute. So they would have basically all year gathered, that little section would have gathered as much um, food as they could to give as a tribute to the kingdom. Uh, and this, there is a case that every month they gave a smaller amount. Is that the case? I don't know. So I think that they happened every, once a month they sent out uh, a whole lot. Maybe they gave a little bit per month, so they split it up per month into 12 times and then one by month they gave, one per month they gave a little bit, but we're not sure how it exactly worked, um, but it seems like this is the, the way the empires have basically set up their tributes everywhere throughout history. So basically meant that the people were, who were used to grow food, they made food, they cared for livestock, they gathered wheat, all that sort of stuff. They had to be basically gathering 24-7, not 24-7, they did get breaks, I'm sure. They had to be gathering all year round though, um, collecting for a whole year, putting aside the amount that they needed to provide King Solomon. Um, and then they probably would have had a lot more that they sent off to Hiram, sent off as trade, um, obviously kept for themselves to eat as well. There was a lot of stuff. Um, we're going to have a look at, in a minute about uh, how much food was actually given. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot, though. Um, it wasn't like a couple of trucks just turned up at a warehouse and loaded up some crates um, and a few chickens and stuff. They, the amount of transport would have been just go around the clock the amount of carts and horses that would have been um, coming in and out of this, these different different states. So it's an entire system. It's, it's made, it's constructed, thousands of people slaving, this is millions of people, slaving away to make enough food to support the king and his household, which is something Samuel warned, didn't he? He warned that this would happen even when they, they took on Saul, that the, the, the tithes would become a burden. That's what they used back in the day, tithes, because the king was in control. Um, that's what they did under the mosaic system. They brought personal tithes, um, but, they, but here they're basically made to work to produce uh, for the king and for the kingdom. So Judah is the only, only tribe that isn't covered by tributes. Okay, So Judah is the only tribe here. Um, and maybe it's because Solomon himself is in that tribe um, and therefore exempted. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe that area was used for something else. There might have been some other reason why it didn't have any... Any tribute. Maybe it was too desert, there was too much desert out there and there wasn't enough food out there. Um, but maybe it's an indication that in the future age that uh, the, tr the tribe of Judah will be exempted from the taxes of the land. Unsure. But um, it's just interesting that they didn't have to give any tribute. So whatever Solomon did, it worked. It says that in verse 20 of chapter 4 that Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. So Everything was good. Everyone was happy. There was prosperity ev everywhere. Um, you know, it's an incident. It had an incidental effect, didn't it? All this stuff, because even though they were prosperous themselves, and they were giving to the material, building materials and the vast produce for the king, as well as providing for the many sacrifices in the land, they were all happy. And we we read in later. We'll read later on that the queen of Sheba, Sheba noticed that all the servants are so happy. Everyone was so happy. 
And, you know, and the way that he had set up this land, everyone was thriving, everyone loved what they were doing, um, and it allowed them to be partners, basically, in what, what was happening in the land. And to this day, God has never asked us to give what he has not first supplied. We only give him back what he has already given us. And everyone in the land comp- contributed in, that way, in, in some way. And even surrounding nations provided them, uh, and then provided gifts to Solomon, contributing most likely to the financing of the house of prayer for all nations. So let's have a quick look at how much was actually produced. It says there in verse 22 um, that... Oh, yeah, it says in verse 22 how much he was actually given. They drank, they ate, uh, they were merry. Um, Solomon ruled over all these, all these kingdoms. They, brought them, uh, they all brought him tribute and served him all his life. So the list of provisions was what, we, what we're going to read here now. They're coming straight to his house, straight to his court. This isn't just going throughout the whole, the whole land. This is coming straight to him for his personal uh, court and for the people there. So at first it seems that he loves food. That's what it seems, that he just wants to eat whatever he wants. Um, maybe he was like a King Henry VIII, you know, he's getting served all the fancy foods, chuck and bones everywhere, you know. I don't, think, I don't think that's what he was. Even though he was an entertainer, he was a very lavish entertainer. He had overseas visitors coming all the time to visit him because, you know, he was so wise, he was so famous. Everyone wanted to see him. Plus he had a big family, a thousand wives and... No, 300 wives and, and concubines, 1,000 wives and concubines, basically. Um, he had all his cabinet. He probably had all these people's families, uh, all his friends, all his servants. So we're talking about a lot of people, um, of people he needs to serve to impress on how amazing his kingdom was. So verse 22 to 23, it says that uh, the Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour, coming to him. 30 uh, measures of fine flour, Three score measures of meal, um, ten fat, fat oxen, twenty oxen out of the pastures, hundred sheep besides hearts, roebucks, fallow deer, and fatted fowl. So he has a lot of stuff coming to him. Now this is basically what it is. Thirty uh, measures of fine flour. He has a few different opinions on this, but um, from what I've researched, it's about 220 litres is a measure, uh, or it's a core in the Hebrew. So basically, um, and the fine flour too, it says fine flour. So that's like removing all the husks of the wheat and getting to the tiny bit of the middle and then grounding that. So he's getting 220 litres uh, per measure, which is basically um, 6,600 litres of fine flour. Um, and he's got 13,200 litres of meal, which equates to about 20 tonnes of wheat per day is coming into the king's house. So that's a lot of it, 20 tonnes of food coming into the land a day. Um, of wheat. I don't know, I guess they're making bread and biscuits with the wheat, don't know, and the flour. I'm not sure what they did back then, but, you know, apparently this, they're saying that this would sustain 14,000 people per day. Um, so everyone in Solomon's, Solomon's house under his administration, including servants and officers that were fed, that's what it says in verse 27, that, and those officers provided victual for King Solomon, and for all that came unto King Solomon's table, every man in his month, they lacked nothing. Barley also and straw and horses uh, for the horse. Oh, I said barley and straw for the horses and for the camels. Brought they unto a place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. So not only the men and the women, but the animals too. They got part of this as well. Uh, it was brought to where they were. Um, yeah, they must have... So these people, it says that these, these uh, uh, officers who provide a victual, they could have been stationed way out in a, in a lumber camp somewhere or, a, or some quarry or some chariot city or overseeing some uh, engineering extravaganza, whatever it was, the food was couriered to them and fed to them. So there's a lot of people coming and getting food as, we go th- uh, as, they, uh, as they went through. There's a lot, a lot of food coming through every day. Think about the amount of chariots and that to get 20 tonnes of food per day coming into Solomon's court. Um, so he had to feed all his men, all his servants, and a lot of things. It says in verse 23, they have 10 oxen, 20 oxen out of the pastures, 100 sheep, hearts, roebucks, deer, and fatted fowl per day. 
So we're not talking about a small village with a couple of uh, farms out the back. We're talking about an empire with unbelievable administration to run. You know, cities getting built, materials getting carted. That's, that's aside from all the food being grown and transported at all times. So we think this is impressive, right? And it draws our mind, I think, when I think about the amount of stuff that they're making and how, how rich the land was. It sort of brings your mind to the kingdom age. And we're gonna, there's going to be a great administration then too. Infrastructure, farms, food, an empire of activity to make a glorious land run smoothly. And Christ said himself, Well done, my servant. You will be ruler over ten cities. And you can rule over five cities. And you can rule over two cities. It's a global management uh, run by Christ. And so is this just interesting dialogue or is there something deeper? I always look to like, like to look deeper into these things. But uh, Luke 22 verse 28, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer, you on a, uh, confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There's a lot of echoes there from, from Solomon's day, the 12 tribes or the 12 sectors. Eating and drinking at my table, which is what the, the officers and the servants did. And you will have specific roles. Eat at my table, he says, just like Solomon's day. And what a privilege that is for us to think about. Imagine getting the role of sitting at Christ's table as one of the rulers of his cities or tribes. It'd be incredible, you know. Reserved, no doubt, to probably the more faithful men throughout history, but we can still have a happy place and a, a, as a happy servant in his kingdom, which is exactly what these people were. They were happy. When we have a look at uh, 1 Kings 4, we, we have a real emphasis on food. People, uh, people running the land, keeping an eye on the fertile lands, making sure it produces good fruit. Food being brought to the king's house, people eating, drinking and being merry. So the land was thriving and how good does this land sound? It sounds so good. Food being produced at that vast amount. Farmers would be very jealous, I'm sure. It was what their whole, their whole economy, their entire infrastructure was based on how good the, this food was and how much they produced. So God had blessed Solomon so much, the land just kept on giving and giving and they were able to exchange whatever they wanted, you know, stone for food, timber for food, workers for food, uh, gold for food, anything they wanted. They had that good, good of stuff that they were able to trade it for uh, anything else they wanted. And what the, land, uh, what the land will become again in the kingdom age when Christ cleanses the land of its layers and, you know, all these layers of smog and um, concrete and litter and all that sort of thing. We can see a beautiful lifestyle that can be re-established in the land. They had to keep the law uh, to keep them in place and provide religious structure to their economy too. Solomon established his cabinet um, and that provided a fantastic economy and a great government. It was peace and stability. It was given to Solomon by God, another type of the kingdom age. Everyone was, was very happy. They were merry. They dwelt under their fig trees in total contentment and harmony. They dwelled, dwelt every man, it says, under his vine. So they had a little piece of land to themselves. It's, they were given that. They were able to take advantage of this amazing fertile land as well, as Solomon gave us them. He said, you can have a little bit of this yourself. As long as you, you help and you work, you can have a bit of this yourself. And many of the world's population throughout you know, medieval England and France couldn't, couldn't even do this. In Solomon's day, they had property rights. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 9 says... The increase from the land is taken by all. Even the king himself profits from the fields. And the, the little things that Solomon knew, um, the things he needed to make this, this land uh, function properly. And if we look at this story as an ecclesia, brethren and sisters, we, we, where all these structures have been put in place to run smoothly, for a good spiritual economy to thrive, so everyone can grow, so everyone can learn, so everyone can worship. We, can, we all have a role, big or small, to make sure that it, it continues to thrive. And what happens when everyone chips, everyone chips in and everyone is merry and, and partakes every week? Well, it says in verse 27 that they lacked nothing. They lacked nothing. And we have, all we have all we need here in our ecclesia. 
and even so, uh, more so in the kingdom that we so long for so today. So we'll leave this study here, uh, brethren and sisters and young people. We'll continue uh, next, uh, next class in two weeks' time. Um, journey through this life of Solomon. We'll come to the uh, pinnacle of his reign, the most important part, the reason why he was king on earth, the whole reason why he was made king, uh, to build that incredible house of God. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen